I personally think that if in some 500 years historians will look back and analyze these first decades during which humankind has digitalized its information and communication flows, they will find that there have been significant changes in the way business is being done and in the way government works. But I think they will find the most profound long-term changes in the way that society creates its common will, especially through democratic processes. Democracy usually goes along two axes that constrains how democracy can be implemented. On the one hand, you have the size of the group that can be large or small. Uh, and if you have a large group size, usually you have to restrict the amount of information that you can express. For example, through voting, we are able to invo involve a lot of people, but we limit the depth of the will expression to yes, no, candidate A or candidate B, uh, simply because in the times of Madison and Jefferson, it was impossible to think that you could involve millions of people in an open deliberation. So the solution to that has traditionally been that we limit the size of the group to a smaller group size, for example, through representative democracy uh, in Congress or in the Senate to 100, 200 people. And these are then invited to deliberate openly. So democracy is usually going along these two trade off axes. However, now in digital networks, such as in social media, we see nowadays millions of people, even a billion people in some networks, deliberating, open expressing their opinions freely. Uh, and these are very sizable groups of people that are involved in these kind of deliberations. So the idea of e-democracy, of bringing democratic discourse into electronic networks, goes around the vision of taking advantage of these kind of online deliberations through different tools. How can we think about that? Let's look at a very simple example of how digital intermediation can help us to realize dem democracy to a bigger extent. Um, let's imagine we have a discussion about public spending on education and respective tax adjustments. Imagine we have five people in our society. The first is a businessman who says, I favor education spending, but preferably with existing resources. The second is an astronaut and he says, well, education spending comes above all and corresponding tax increases are adequate as resources are no limitation in the astronaut world he's living in. Uh, the third one is a nun who says, I prefer to keep the status quo, but if to change, then she would favor education. The clown says, the truth is I am completely indifferent regarding education, but most importantly, change is needed, especially in the proportion of current public spending. And the fifth one is a princess who says, well, I'm also indifferent regarding education, but as I'm sick, I'm against discriminating against any other sort of public spending, such as health. Okay, so now we have our society five opinion. What will you now do about spending and respective tax adjustments. Well, we have a lot of information here and the idea of democracy is finding out what do these people actually want. They now express their will. One solution would be, well, we create a representative democracy and let them talk among each other. That would be one extreme. The other extreme would be, well, we just let them vote. Education up and or taxes up in order to finance it or not. So if we go for the second version, that's what it could, for example, look like. First preference would be the tax that the business guy would say taxes should stay equal and education should be increased. The astronaut says, bring the taxes up, create it, bring the education spending up. The nun says both should be in the status quo and both the clown and the princess says, well, taxes shouldn't be changed out of different reasons and education spending, we prefer it to go down. So these five people would now vote, that's what would happen. The majority, consisting of the clown and the princess, would actually rule the society. Now, if you remember from the previous slide, actually, the clown and the princess, they've been quite indifferent, both of them being quite indifferent, but they now rule the day.
that is usually known as the tyranny of the silent majority. Uh, the other ones have very strong feeling about it, but they cannot agree on uh, a solution if you put it in these simple terms, up or down, and that only expressing the first preference. Now, the truth is, uh, what we can also do is look at a second, third, fourth, or fifth preference, for example, that these people have. And says, so okay, if you wouldn't get your first choice, what would be your second, third, fourth, or fifth choice? And what we can see here, I just drew that out of you, invited to compare the statements I had on the previous page with this preference ranking. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure they are consistent. And you can see that actually here, uh, most of the people in the society have the option of having no change in taxes and bringing education spending down as almost their last preference. They hate it. They don't agree at all with what the silent majority would vote for. Now, this creates a very unstable society because these three, they will not like what is implemented after this first preference vote. Now, the idea is, can we take advantage of more than just a simple yes, no vote and take advantage of all the different preferences people actually have. Can we somehow deal with it and find then a compromise that everybody can live with? For example, have a look at this option here, the option that taxes would stay equal and education spending would go up. Actually, three of our five people would prefer that one even is his first choice. Uh, only the princess would disagree. But this would create already a more stable compromise in our society. We can also say, well, if somebody really says uh, she doesn't like it at all, we shouldn't also foster that. So let's look for this option. Bring the taxes up and bring education spending up. Everybody can somehow live with that. Nobody is really completely against it. And it might be an interesting compromise to go for. So the idea is that we can use digital technology to look at more than just a simple yes, no vote. And information processing capacities, digital information processing capacities enable us to also process all of that. Of course, as I said, in the times of Jefferson and Madison, that was impossible to think about. But think about all the information that is contained in social networks, for example, that we can make use of. The digital footprint that is left behind with all of our interactions, with our will expressions. We can draw a lot of information from there in order to give democracy a real meaning, in a sense that it should reflect and also form and shape the opinion of the public. Now, to continue with this example, there are many ways we can use digital information processing to reform voting procedures. For example, nowadays we mainly use a ballot vote or we use a runoff vote. It means we, through different routes, we determine who is the candidate and runoff votes are basically information processing procedures. We do the runoff in order to be better able to process information. Of course, we can use digital technologies to guide that. And we can get much more information from the people. For example, we can do approval votes. You can vote for any number of options. You can do ranked votes. Who is your first, second, third choice? You can do cumulative votes. You tell people you have 10 points distribute them among the candidates, among the issues, or rated vote. We just say, well, rate them from minus 10 to plus 10. So which one is the best way of getting more information out of the people? That's a second question. And a lot of active research will need to be done to find the optimal ways of how to formulate democracy. But the basic premise is that information processing is not the problem anymore. It was in the past, but e-democracy can help us, help us to transcend this trade-off between group size and depth of will expression. And there are many more different ways of how we can bring democracy to life instead of just simply say, or you have a representative democracy, or you have a simple ballot vote.